Page 9F was put together by this Dennis O'Malley. I've seen it since, so I don't know where he got it, but uh, it's an interesting concept. Now, be careful we don't mix terms. It, it talks about your gross profit calculation. And in effect, what it's saying is it's a warning. It says, uh, look out before you cut prices. You must sell more to break even when you cut a price. It's a it's a scale that you can use, and, and let's just make a couple easy assumptions. Your gross profit is across the top of the sheet, and your price cuts down the left-hand corner. And this is one of those kind of charts where if you merge the two, you get the answer. For example, let's say your gross profit is 25%. So go to the 25% column across the top. And let's say you cut a price by 10%. Just follow 25% down and 10% across, and the answer you get is 66.7%. Here's what that answer says. If your gross profit 25% and you cut your price by 10%, you only have to sell 66.7% more to get back to where you were before you cut the price. Is that all? That's all. And see, one of the great arguments of many salespeople, and I am one of them, is, you know, boy, we could sell more if we just had a cheaper price. So just, just start to ask yourself, how much more do you have to sell? And I'll play that out to a manufacturing type gross profit. Look out at 40%. And look at a pretty common discount, 15%. Just run those two across, see what happens to you. You only have to sell 60% more to get right back to where you were before you screwed around with the price. <laughs> okay. But you still have more, more money coming in, right? Or cash flow. Um, yeah. Cash flow, uh, not gross profit. So we have more cash flow and return on investment side. Yeah. Yes. Sometimes those are more important. And, and yes, they are. But right I can think of business where cash flow, you can almost lose money uh, as long as the cash flow is okay. As that's as it's that's not, not true in a service business, but it is it's true in a lot of manufacturing businesses. Not really lose money, but... but yeah. I didn't catch that point. They were saying... What they're really saying is you're going to be dealing with greater gross dollars, so the, the, smaller, the smaller percentage you're going to be dealing with will be larger dollars and therefore have a different calculation against the, the balance sheet. For example, in, our, in the, um, the canoe case, $20 mm -hmm. is 5% of 400 is one calculation against the uh, balance sheet, whatever your investment is. $35. Or, or let's drop it down to thirty dollars. It's smaller than five percent return, but it'll give you a hell of a lot better uh, cash cash relationship to the return on investment analysis. And you are right. Uh, sometimes that's uh, the right thing to do. Yes. Just to make one interesting observation from a client of mine that just has gone through a major um, analysis of their business. An entrepreneur was replaced by a accounting type as head of a division, one of my big accounts in New Jersey. And in the analysis of their business, they're in the disposable paper and packaging business. He found out that 20% of their customers represented 135% of their profit. The other 80% of their customers brought the profit down to 100%. And they made an analysis and they purged almost $8 million worth of business that they were currently accommodating and are making more money by getting rid of the How come they didn't raise their price to them? They didn't. The, their customers weren't accepting the right price. Might be competitive. That's probably how they purged them by yeah. raising their prices. And they just right? dropped out. See, you run into other things too. Uh, and let's wrap this up with just a couple more thoughts. One is, some businesses are price elastic or sensitive, some are not. For example, Harley, you sell Volkswagens. And I don't know what Volkswagens sell for these days. Well, let's pretend they sell for 10 grand. 10 grand. If, if you could lower the price of your Volkswagen to $9,000, the assumption in that marketplace is you would sell more Volkswagens. That is a price sensitive market. Well, let's go to Mercedes. I don't know what they sell for readers. Anybody know? 50? 50. 60 SEL is about 60 grand. 60 grand, okay. Now, now the question is, if you lowered the price of that 60 grand car by a few thousand dollars, would it affect the sales in that car? And most of the automotive industry says no. So now you have two makes at different ends of the marketplace. One's price sensitive, one is not. 
So you have to ask yourself another question. Are you a price-sensitive business? For example, if you lower the price, is, will your volume outperform where you were previously? In my business, we are not price-sensitive. I, I can almost cut my price to a third, and I won't get materially more sales than I have now. And, and in the process, go out of business, I might have. In about 1972 or 1973, we were a nice little training company, doing fine, had our prices out in the marketplace, and we tend to be budgeted so that if you're a corporation, you'll say to me, okay, I've got X number of thousands of dollars for training next year. So the money that's committed to us within the calendar year is a, is a hard number, typically. Well, one of our guys happened to live on the East Coast, and he was out on a fishing trip, and God love him forever, he drowned. And was, you know, once we went through all the, oh my gods, what are we going to do? We had another problem. I am, I am now in July of our calendar year, and a percentage of our capacity has just disappeared into the waves. I went out with a 15% price increase. Screaming and hollering, why are you doing this in the middle of the year? And we paid the price of, of loss of business. What they did was take their whatever the hell they had for training and just bought that much less of it. And we had the most profitable year in the history of persuasive communications. Now, I don't know if that's a good idea in some cases for the, the long haul strategy because that's another factor, but what I really wanted you to see in this whole exercise is that a 10% cut in price is not a 10% cut in volume. It has incredible impact. A 10% price increase, getting your price, the negotiation process. Just, just ask yourself, don't tell me, what's your quota? And if anyone in this room's got a quota of a million bucks or something, what would negotiations do to you and your, the profitability of your company in the next year if you just left 5% less of that, the money that, that you now leave on the table, on the table. So what is price, what is negotiations? It, it's getting that little extra, not giving away that little extra. It is, it is in fact the financial efficiency of the sale. Now, for some of you that makes a lot of difference, like Robin, uh, and business from self, others of you might get paid on gross profit. Others of you might have the mindset that uh, you're a good company person and you want your company to be profitable and, and whatever. Certainly, I know that's true in your case because you're so involved in uh, your account. You know that your job will disappear if you don't stay profitable. And, and in a larger sense, that's true for everybody in this room. That's absolutely true. So I wanted to give you a, a different and what I consider to be uh, a more professional than the average look at part of our job as a professional salesperson because the truth of the matter is Professional salespeople are really business people that travel. At least that's that's the way I want my people uh, to be in the 1980s and the late 80s and 90s. I don't want peddlers anymore. You know, uh, twenty-five thousand dollar a year salesmen that run a route and just sell volume are a dime a dozen, and that's not what the future of many many good companies are. You know, I. I, I, I teasing the other day, I'm mentioning I'm 53 and I'm starting to feel it, but I also realized something else. When I first came into sales a million years ago, it feels like, salespeople were kind of, uh, you know, they're salesmen. It is not uncommon today for a significant number of the people in my classrooms to have their master's degree or working on their master's. I don't know if some of you overheard, but I'm planning a, a back operation later on this year. and it, it's not a, a simple thing. And I looked around for a couple of doctors, and I found this one guy who's supposed to be very good. And I was talking to him, telling him my problem, and he wants me to come in and whatever. And I asked him a little bit about himself. And he said something interesting. He said, I, I spend about 45 or 50 days a year, every year, back in a classroom, learning the latest techniques and latest procedures and machinery. He said, and I think that should should make you comfortable because I'm better prepared to take care of you because I've not stopped educating myself. Just because I graduated from medical school 20 years ago, I haven't stopped learning. Impressed the hell out of me. Well, why not us too? Just think about it. You know, and we not no one in this room has learned everything they ever need to know to do their job or or live their life.